Brought to you by JMR Rentals, professional digital cinema and broadcast equipment rentals in Brooklyn, New York. JMRNY.com. And now get 15% off your first rental when you use the promo code WEEKEND. Call 347-721-3400 or email info at jmrny.com for details. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and joining me via Zoom today, she is an award-winning filmmaker and the founder of the Long Island International Film Expo. We first met her at the Soho International Film Festival with her current project, Couple of Guys, Miss Deborah Markowitz. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's great to have you. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to a chance to talk to you when we were at Soho. But uh, this is good anyway because we can talk and relax. Uh, you mm-hmm. can have a glass of wine if you want to. Um, it's, it's much more chill uh, than the noisy, uh, bustling uh, red carpet thing. So I want to talk to you about the Film Expo, uh, of course, and I want to talk to you about uh, your project and upcoming projects. But first, I want to talk to you about you. So um, how did you get into uh, the old show business? What is your origin story? Oh, that's interesting. (laughs) I started way back in the day as a theater major um, at a local junior college. And then after doing that for a year, I realized that I needed to do something to be able to pay rent. So um, I decided to go into business management um, to Hofstra University, uh, probably a few years before. It took me the eight and a half year plan to graduate Hofstra because I worked during the day and I worked on the weekend. And uh, as I was about to graduate, I went to go work for the County of Nassau and I basically created the Nassau County Film Commission. Um, So I had done that for 33 years through four administrations. And about 25 years ago, I was approached by the Long Island Film and TV Foundation, which is a not-for-profit group about having a film festival in Nassau County. So um, I had met Anne and Henry Stamfell, who own the Belmore Movies and the Malvern Cinema, where we started, and um, several other people who have moved on and um, whatnot. And we started the Long Island International Film Expo. So that will be going on 25 years this July. And then about nine years ago, um, a director came to my office because he wanted to um, cast an actor that he knew, I knew, in his movie. And I don't tend to do that with names unless it's a a job and I don't like to, didn't like to confuse my nine to five or whatever. But uh, since he was sent by the county executive, I said, let me read your script. And I read it and I said, you have the wrong actor in mind. And I, I suggested some other friends and he said, can he get them? I said, well, we can try. So from that moment, I ended up becoming his casting director as well as his producer on My Cross to Bear. And then I wasn't gonna do it again because I figured this is a lot of work and I have my job. And uh, then three weeks later, somebody sent me a script um, for someone who needed a producer and a casting director. And I said, all right, well, out of respect for the person who sent them my way, I figured, okay, well, I'll just read it. And about 10 pages into it, I realized it was one of the best things I've ever read. So I ended up going on to that and then um, being a CD on my first feature film. And after I did that, it was called Living with the Dead, a love story, uh, wonderfully written by uh, Christine Vertugian. And then after that, I decided I wanted to direct something just to see what it meant to direct. Uh, So I wrote a short, short film about, I guess it's about eight, nine years ago now, uh, called The Last Taxi Driver with uh, Robert Clahessy from Blue Bloods was in it, Deb Twist from Kick-Ass, uh, Emily Jackson from Incarnate. And um, much to my surprise, it ended up starting to win awards. So <laughs> that was pretty exciting. And um, right after that, I decided to do a film called Leaving. Um, and it just, everything just took off from there. And I ended up at one point working on either my film or somebody else's film like every three weeks. And I simply was not sleeping. So um, after that, then I just got a lot more selective and, and I continue to learn and I will continue to work for other people on occasion. But it's, you know, you almost become addicted to it. Um, there's, almost, there's nothing like making a movie. Um, if it's if it's a great story and you're working with incredible people and uh, yeah, COVID slowed us down a bit, but I've just actually been doing mostly non-union projects during COVID, 
um, very small ones, very safely. Uh, but it's just, it becomes a way of life, you know? It's just very hard to give it up. Well, let's talk about the, the Long Island Film Expo. Now, this is a, a film festival, essentially, that takes place on Long Island. You mentioned how it came about a little bit, but what kind of was the purpose? What, what was the mission of the fest? Well, the first mission was the fact that it was supposed to be a very, very easy project. Somebody was going to come with us with films. All we had to put was the Nassau County name on it. And um, we would basically get all the glory. But unfortunately, uh, the person who was going to give us all the films didn't give us all the films. And since I had already um, got the approval and brought it to the attention of the county executive, I could not not have a film festival. So we put on in about 12 weeks, we found about 40 really high quality films from different distributors and whatnot. And there weren't 5 million film festivals back then. Um, so uh, we got some great, and a lot of the films were on film. That's how long ago this was. And um, we uh, just, it ended up being way more successful than we thought it would be because the Malvern Cinema is an art cinema in, in Nassau County and they have five screens. So people going to see other movies would go, well, what's, what's this? Let's go, let's go see the film festival because it had a very sophisticated, ded uh, dedicated um, movie going audience. So that worked very well for us for the first few years. And the idea of it was to bring attention to Nassau County. Uh, and then it became really more about the filmmakers and the films. Um, as, it, as it progressed, it became more about uh, providing a community uh, for the filmmakers. So um, we ended up moving to the Belmore Movies because it had a larger theater, it had a stage, it had a lounge, uh, which we did not have at the Malvern. So we leave the lounge open all week where filmmakers can network. Um, we have panels um, and, and usually have four or five, maybe sometimes seven or eight panels uh, for information that might be good for the filmmakers. Um, we provide a lot of networking. Uh, we have a 350 seat theater, which was a godsend during COVID because we had an in-person film festival, but we could um, stagger everybody. And uh, one of our films actually sold out, but we sold out at hundred seats less than we would have sold because of COVID. So, um, you know, we, we lost the ticket sales, but it was very important for us to do things safely. So basically it's providing, um, um, an atmosphere, an environment, um, a, a community for the filmmakers local. And we've also had many foreign filmmakers pre-COVID fly in from France and Spain and Italy and spend the whole week and really get to know each other. So I'm going to say one of the best things about life is that it is a film community and you're going to make great connections. And a lot of people who have met at life ended up working together and making different films. So that's to us, that's the key to success. Do you guys have a specific type of movie that you look for? Now you... Uh, you do shorts and features as well? Yes. Yeah. What's like the profile of a, a Long Island Film Expo film? Like what kind of what kind of films have you accepted in the past? What does well there? Like if somebody was looking to submit, what should they what what what's your type in other words for films? Well, we um take films of every genre. Uh we did start with a dedicated horror block at night, one or two late at night uh, for the horror filmmakers. We started this past year um, with a Midnight Madness block that started at midnight and just the really crazy films. Um, and it, it did actually very well, um, which, which we didn't know what would happen with that. Um, and uh, during the day, we will screen a lot of documentaries uh, and foreign films and um, films that would be, um, good for senior citizens, good for, you know, older people and, and whatnot. So we program according to who we know the audience might be. Um, I think it's just gotta be a good, unique film. Um, really hard to, to say what it is, but it's, it's gonna be something we know is gonna entice somebody to see the films, you know? I always look at as people I would love to work with one day, you know, in my mind, when I, wow, that's great, okay. Have there been some success stories people have gotten you know, screen there and gotten distribution through there or people have gone on to the next level kind of thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the first success story that we had, um, it was a, a movie, I believe it was called The Unbelievable Truth. And um, at the time, distributors would come to the film festival and um, we had the closing night at a catering hall. And what I would do is take the distributors who came to closing night take the most promising films and actually sit those filmmakers at the table together and, and films did get picked up that way. Um, success stories we've had, there's been a few of them. 
we had a documentary called Into the Arm of Strangers, Into the Arms of Strangers, which actually won an Academy Award um, for Best Documentary after we had it. Um, we had a filmmaker who came to us with a film called Pretty Ugly People several, several years ago. And uh, Tate Taylor was the director of the film. And he was straight in from Mississippi and he was kind of a nervous wreck. So I kind of kept him by me and guided him to the train and everything else because we're right by the train station. And um, he ended up winning one of the best film categories. Tate went on to, uh, he and his partner at the time went on to um, produce a film called uh, The Help. And the, the writer of that was, I believe, Tate's best friend. And so before there was even any thought of making it into a movie, they would send me an email, said, do me a favor, can you promote this? We want to make it, but we know it'll be much easier to make it if it's a bestseller. So we started spreading the word. Everybody started spreading the word. Of course, it ended up being bought by, um, I, want, I want to say, I, I don't want to say the name, I'm getting it wrong, by a really big name, but um, the only way that the producers would agree to have it made is if Tate directed it. So he got to direct this wonderful film called The Help. And since then he directed um, uh, the James Brown story. I don't remember the name of it, but he ended up really becoming, you know, becoming fairly big. So we have a few stories like that, Academy Award winners and, and directors that have just uh, become really big successes. I know that Elias Plagianos has won several awards with us over the year, and he just got hired to film a TV series uh, based on a best-selling author whose name is gonna totally escape me right now, but he just announced it two days ago. So we do have those people that, that move up and, and uh, it's a great thing to see that. Is there kind of, um, uh, because I know that Soho is gonna start doing this soon, and I know that you know, people like Sundance or the Sundance Institute, Tribeca, of course, has the Tribeca Institute. Is there any plan to, like, implement educational forums and things like that into the festival? Or do you guys do that already? Well, we do it in the way of panels. Um, you know, it's, um, we'll have things, whether it's on film financing, whether it's on distribution, whether it's on tax credits. Um, we do have people come right to the film festival. We also have, um, we started doing via Zoom, um, filmmakers connection meetings. We'll, we'll have a speaker come and, and talk about their projects and answer questions. Um, we haven't done that in the last few months because we've been going live with a lot of things, but uh, we have been discussing starting to do that again. Um, and we had Elias Plagianos and we've had, um, I think we've had Ely Hirschko who's doing very well. Um, we'll get, the nice thing about Zoom is you can have filmmakers come in from all over the world. So um, that's a kind of cool thing. We did our closing party the year before last uh, via Zoom, and we had filmmakers staying up from Italy and, and uh, uh, Russia, and they were they were able to, even though it was the middle of the night, they were able to participate. That was kind of fun. With the festival coming up for 2022 here, kind of what are the plans? Are you guys going to be in person? Are you going to do a hybrid? What's the plan for going forward? you have the dates and everything set yet? It's uh, if, if you go to our site, which is longislandfilm.com, it'll give you the dates and, and the link. Uh, we're on Film Freeway, but there's a lot of film festivals now that threw Long Island in their name. So I always say go through the site, longislandfilm.com. Um, we're, the, we're the guys who've been there for 25 years. And, um, you know, you can uh, enter through Film Freeway. Uh, so it's going to be in person unless something bizarre happens. But last year was in person and the year before, uh, because everything was going virtual, we wanted to have an in-person presence as well. So we had a drive-in and uh, we were able to play 40 of our films uh, at the drive-in. So we were still in person. Uh, so our plan this year is to do live, uh, but we might keep the virtual component, always giving the filmmaker an opt out if they want it. Uh, but um, there's filmmakers who may not be ready to travel yet and they want to be part of the film festival. So um, we kind of like that idea. Uh, we, we obviously are pushing live, but we want to give everybody the opportunity uh, to, to be a part of it. I love the drive-in thing. Uh, I know Greenpoint Film Festival did that last year when we covered it. And um, I think it's going to be kind of a, maybe COVID is resurrecting drive-ins. Like maybe that's a, a, silver, a oh, yeah. silver lining from it. I want to move on now to talk about your project and your upcoming project. So a uh, couple of guys, which is a great title. It sounds definitely like it was made up 
by somebody from Long Island. Um, what uh, what is what is the series about, and kind of what's uh, what's going on with it right now in terms of the festival circuit? A couple of guys. Uh, we have the first three episodes done. It's um, I envision it as a, a ten episode um, limited series, and. Uh, we're just basically sending out the pilot now. Uh, we've done very few film festivals with it because I'm mostly trying to get the pitch packet ready and get it sold, but I, I want to get some feedback. And um, it's been really well received. Um, it's, it's basically the story about Richard Durant, who is a uh, divorce attorney who is heading into his 50s and he's just divorced his wife, he's had children and he's never come out as gay before. And um, he finally is willing to live his life as, as a gay man. And um, he meets the love of his life in, in a CD store. And his, his love of life is played by um, uh, Lucas Hassel, who was Elias Van Dyke on the blacklist. And um, he meets this rocker, you know, this really hot rocker in, in a CD store, and they end up starting a relationship. And this is completely new for Richard. So Richard is ready to start living, and, and John is ready to settle down. So they have all the things that, that happen with that. and. Um, well, I don't want to give away all the, um, you know, what happens, but basically Richard comes out to, to John and then all of a sudden his whole life changes completely because nobody knew, not his family, not anyone. Um, and he didn't even want to have to deal with it himself. Um, one of the things that um, was the best feedback ever was we got accepted to the Image Out Film Festival in Rochester and um, that's supposed to be a very difficult film festival to get into. And so now we have, even though anybody can see it, it's in essence a love story. And, um, but this was the exact market audience, you know, middle-aged uh, white, get, well, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be white, but just gay men. And, and so we had a whole room full of them and John and like, are they, are they can accept it, are they gonna like it? And they loved it, they loved it. And uh, we did a very extensive Q and A after. And, um, the one, some of the questions were, did you have cultural consultants? And I said, absolutely. We had three different ages of gay men, you know, and, and basically, is there anything here that's offensive? We don't know is offensive. What do you like? What do you not like? And, um, you know, they all seemed to love it. There was, I think, one joke that was interesting because I had three different reactions to it. The younger gay man said, this is hilarious. Um, the, the gay man in the middle said, I think this is really offensive. And the one who was older said, depends on the relationship, didn't bother him at all. And I said, you know what, that's not important enough to this movie to, to even really offend anybody. So I just took it out. Um, but they really appreciated that. And um, one gentleman uh, thanked me a lot. He said, because we're not reflected, you know, we're not really reflected as either the main character or if we, uh, a lot of times we're a stereotype. He said, I actually came out of my 40s after I was married and had kids. And this is the first time I've ever seen that reflected. So that meant a lot to us. Um, so we're, we're uh, going to look for a showrunner now to, to get it out there. Um, it's in essence a comedy, but it's it's a love story in, at the end of the day. And, and the feedback even from the non uh, gay LGBTQ film festival has been very positive. So we're excited about that. And it stars Sal Randino, um, who's now in uh, Organized Crime on TV, Lucas Hassel from Blacklist, Abigail Hawk from Blue Bloods, um, Deb Twist from Kick-Ass, um, Kevin Brown from 30 Rock, Brian O'Halloran from Clerks. Uh, Clerks 3 has got, um, is in a couple of episodes, uh, Noelle Diane, Max Tamarkin. So we've got a really nice ensemble cast and uh, every day we film is just wonderful. Oh, Karan Sheehan, I should talk about that, Karan. He's, uh, was one of Broadway's Phantom of, of the Opera. So, uh, you know, he gets to actually sing in this, which is a lot of fun. Lucas sings um, because there's music at the background of this whole thing. You know, John's a musician. So therefore, you know, the music of uh, Tom Griffith and uh, Martha Trachtenberg is like all throughout this. And it's, it's pretty exciting. So as far as um, networks and things, do you have places in mind where you'd like to pitch or places that you could see it uh, happening? I can see this actually as um, Lifetime, and um, Lifetime would be a really good fit for this. Also, Showtime potentially uh, seem to be two of the markets we're going to look at. Um, I'm actually going to speak to a producer. I'm working on the pitch deck. Once I have my draft that, there's an executive producer I want to go to who's won some Emmy Awards and whatnot. He was very interested in seeing this. He saw the rough cuts. So he told me, as soon as this is done, get me the pitch deck and maybe I can come aboard. So 
We'll see what happens with that. So uh, going forward, you said you have some stuff in the hopper currently. You're working on some other projects. What have you got going? I don't know how much you can talk about. We have people all the time who have stuff that can't talk about it, but uh, (laughs) talk about what you can talk about coming up. Well, first of all, as far as festival-wise, a couple of guys is making the rounds. Uh, We also have a film called um, The Waiting Room, uh, which is still bouncing around a little bit at festivals. And uh, Confidant is another short film I did that's that's been bouncing around a little bit. So that's on the festival trail. Um, We are currently um, just finishing up my first feature film that I directed called The Only Woman in the World. And... um, we are making one minor change and then hopefully we render it tomorrow and we'll be ready to start looking for home for that. Um, I have um, two films that I'm going to be directing. Are there only two? I think there's only two that I can think of. Uh, oh, um, one is called Sfortunato and uh, it's, I can't talk too much about that, but um, that's a short film I'll be doing. And then there's another film that uh, I'm uh, negotiating with somebody for that she wants me to direct it and um, which I wrote it, actually wrote it for her, for her specs. And, you know, we'll see if I end up directing it, which I probably will if I have time. And I'm also writing a, a, um, um, a Christmas feature uh, with Michael Fadili um, called uh, you, uh, what is it? You'll Tide um, Blessings? Yule Tidings, Yule Tidings is the name of it. Uh, we changed the name so many times, I'm trying to remember. So I'm writing a feature with him and then I have a few other, um, I have a uh, feature script called Porter's Way that I'm waiting uh, for somebody to come in with financing for that. But there's somebody who's you know been talking about that with us. Um, so I wa- really want to get back to my writing. When, when I went into um, COVID times, when we went into the pandemic, we had eight films in post. So now we only have one and we're like five minutes away from finishing it, you know? So that's pretty exciting for us. And then I feel like I need to concentrate on writing a lot more. (laughs) For the one that you're about to finish for Only Woman in the World, can you say what that's about? Yeah, it's about a a woman who's an up and coming director and um, she's got a long-term boyfriend she lives with. And as her career starts to um, grow, she, she sort of becomes very friendly with this actor that you don't know if his intentions are all on the line or not. And uh, sort of becomes a decision what she's going to want in her life, um, who are the people who are true to her. And, um, you know, there's a lot going on with narcissistic relationships out there and, uh, you know, people gaslighting. So it's, it's just a matter of um, her seeing or not seeing what's out there. You know, who do you trust? You know, when you're in a position of being able to help a lot of people, it's very hard to always know who your friends are. So uh, it's something that's actually pretty timely right now, though it's taken us three years because we, when we decided to make this, I had already done a number of shorts and um, we decided that I decided I'm going to do a feature and okay, well, we don't have the money for a feature. So how can we do this? So myself and my husband, who's also my business partner, John Marine, um, I said, well, what if we train the crew, which seemed like a great idea at the time. Um, And it was um, challenging because since we were paying so little, if anything, um, everybody wanted to work with us depending on what jobs they had coming up. So um, we had, I think, four different makeup people, um, depending on who was available. We had uh, like six different uh, ACs because my husband shot it. He was the DP. Um, But if they got a job, they were going to go out if they were paying more than we were. And almost everybody was. Um, A lot of the actors came in for free, which was great, um, deferred. And uh, we had a lot of fun with it. We a lot of fun, a lot of work, a lot of hair pulling. Um, And we spent pretty much three years getting this in the can for a ridiculous amount of money. Um, And then spent just as much in post to fix all the things that, you know, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that we, uh, you know, had to fix because we were training a crew to do sound and, and do everything else. Um, but it's, it's, it actually, we're watching it tonight going, you know, this is actually pretty good. So uh, it's, you know, it's getting there. It's almost there. And, and we'll find out where the home is going to be. But um, it stars Kieran Sheehan, my, my phantom friend, Chris Cardona, um, who's been on a ton of television shows, uh, Bianca Jamat uh, LaRue, who's just done a tremendous job as the lead. Uh, Brian O'Halloran has a part in it that's very funny. Abigail Hawk uh, from Blue Bloods. Um, 
also Kevin Brown has a partner. So I like to work with my friends because if they can help out, they're always there. And it's, it's kind of fun to play together. So, and Artie Pasquale's in it too from The Sopranos. He's got a nice little role and uh, it's fun. Based on that, we're going to wrap up in a second here, but um, you know, this was your first feature, right? First feature that I directed. Do you have uh, a bit of advice that you would want to give to somebody looking to make their first feature? Um, lots of pre-production. I, I kind of, when I want to do something, I want to do it and that's it. Um, I, you know, um, a lot of my scripts I've written in two hours and for some reason tend to be fairly good, but um, lots of pre-production. I can't say that I regret doing it the way we did because I had read Rebel Without a Crew from Robert Rodriguez. I said, I can do this. And we did. So um, you have to decide what you want it to be. Um, if you're going to work with people who maybe don't have a lot of experience, don't spend a ton of money on it. If you have a ton of money, hire really good people. Um, but um, pre-production, really walk through all the scenes. Um, if you can get locations for free, write your script around that, which is what we did um, to make it work. And uh, just have some other people read it and get feedback, which we got. Um, and just know that you can do things two or three ways. You can do it cheap, quick, or good, two of those, but you can't do it all three. So ours was hopefully good and not quick, <laughs> but cheap. So um, you have to realize that. And that's what we've done. Fantastic. So I'm going to wrap up, but uh, for people who want to know more about you, more about uh, the Film Expo, where can they find you guys on the web? Okay. Well, they can find out information about myself and um, our movies at intentionfilmsandmedia.com intentionfilmsandmedia.com and uh or our instagram is at deborah markowitz film d-e-b-r-a as far as the film festival go to longislandfilm.com doesn't get easier than that <laughs> all right great i'm gonna wrap up thank you so much for doing this and thank you all out there for taking this trip down the rabbit hole for more of our content including our movie reviews visit our website no rest for the weekend podcast.com don't forget to like rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast app and now you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash getbehindtherabbit. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest, Deborah Markowitz, and our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.